Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us at the Oregon Center for Nursing's webinar to discuss our latest report, The Characteristics of the Nursing Workforce in Oregon 2016. My name is Jana Bitten. I'm the Executive Director for the Oregon Center for Nursing, and I really appreciate you uh, spending your lunch hour with us to talk a little bit about some of the findings that we have found uh, from the, the information that we collect um, uh, or that we, uh, that we are processing. This is information, this is the information that is uh, collected as part of the nursing uh, relicensure surveys that are, um, that goes through the Oregon Health Authority. So we want to give um, thanks to the Oregon Health Authority for partnering with us uh, and allowing us to get uh, um, access to this data so we can do this in-depth study. We also want to thank, um, let you know that this work is made possible through the Oregon Nurse Advancement Fund. And that's sponsored by Oregon's licensed practical and registered nurses. So thank you to all of the nurses for sponsoring this. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, there, this webinar is going to go, we're going to be going over all of the information that's in the report that you may or may not have already seen. But that's just going to be a portion of what we do. The other portion of of what we have as part of this webinar is an opportunity for you to ask questions that are specific to the research that we've uncovered. And the way to do that is just use your panel. There is a screen that's specific to questions. It's the third from the bottom. If you, if you click in there and type in your question, we've got a couple of places in the webinar where we will read those questions and get them answered for you. If you don't see a question uh, panel for any reason, if you see something that says chat, you're welcome to put something in there too. We are gonna be recording this webinar, so if there's anything that you missed or if you think of a great question in the shower later, you can always reach out to us afterwards and we're, we'll be happy to answer questions that you have. So, um, as, you, as many of you may know, the Oregon Center for Nursing is the state's nursing workforce center, and one of the core tenets of our mission is to provide independently analyzed research on the nursing workforce so that employers and lawmakers and educators and nurses can make good decisions about workforce planning in the state. And so that this particular report that we put together is a cornerstone of the of what we do. This is really going to share with you what the supply of the nurses are in the state, and um, that's why we we've we've done this on a regular basis, and we're going to continue to do this. Just want to make sure that we can share this work with you. So the person that is going to be giving the presentation today is OCN's research director, Rick Aldeyer. Rick, say hello. <laughs> and so I'm going to turn the time over to Rick right now, and he's going to go through some slides that's really going to highlight the, um, the different parts of this report. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, enter them into the screen. We're going to have a couple of places where we can answer those questions. So Rick, I'm turning it over to you. Cool. Thank you, Jan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to be able to present this information to you all. Um, it's um, this is one of our first seminal reports where we're looking across a broad set of demographic and practice type measures in the nursing workforce in Oregon. Um, we are very interested in looking at the supply of nurses in the state for a variety of reasons. One is that we know that there's significant some significant challenges to the workforce in Oregon that are on the horizon, and some of those are already occurring. Um, such as the aging of the population. As the baby boomers start aging, we know we're going to have a significant proportion of our population that's starting to age. And the literature is fraught with copy with, with information show, suggesting that the aging population utilizes health care. One, they use a lot, utilize a lot more health care. They also utilize different types of health care than a younger population. So we're really looking at the aging of the population to have impact on the nursing workforce. The other is um, the aging of the nursing and other health care workforce. Uh, the literature has uh, provided many examples of uh, the aging of the nursing workforce across the country. And so we do look at that. Um, Significant shortages of nurse faculty, which impacts the ability to graduate nurses out of baccalaureate and associate degree programs, which has long-term impacts down the road as you're educating fewer nurses, those nurses won't be available or you'll have uh, shortages in the workforce 
down the line. Um, the other thing that we're all watching very carefully is changes to the healthcare reform laws. Um, those have big impacts on how healthcare is provided in the state, uh, funding issues, all those have some determinants on the nursing workforce. So we really look at these kinds of things and we're really, we're really watching to see how these challenges impact our workforce. Um, there's also been a lot of talk over the years about nursing shortages across the country and in different states. Um, in 2014, uh, HRSA released the Health Resources Services Administration, which does, uh, they have a center of workforce studies, which looks nationally at workforce type issues. And in 2014, in their report, they suggested that Oregon would have a deficit or a shortage of nurses by 2025. Um, so a lot of work was geared up trying to figure out how to ameliorate the effects of that shortage and to see if there's ways that we could increase the amount or the number of nurses that are entering our workforce. In 2017, HRSA released a follow-up study suggesting that instead of having a deficit of nurses, now we actually are, are projected to have a surplus of nurses by 2030. Um, so we so what this, that study suggests is that there may be an ample supply of nurses, but one thing we're we're very, very well aware of is even though statewide there may be an abundant supply of nurses, um, we're pretty certain that those aren't distributed in manners that would alleviate a shortage or eliminate shortages across the state in a uniform fashion. Uh, when we talk to the, uh, when we talk to people in the rural parts of the state, they are, they claim and state very loudly that they are. Um, they have significant issues in being able to fill and, and retain um, adequate nurses in those workforce. So we're gonna look at uh, some of the information that's related back to all these. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is do some simple, to show you how many people we're talking about in the state, how many people are licensed. So this is table one of the report. Um, it shows the number of licensing and practice nursing professionals in Oregon based on the 2016 data. So as you can see, for uh, certified nursing assistants, we had 18,025. I won't go through all of it. RNs, we had uh, 51,926. Um, and so you can see the basic nurse, set of nurses. Uh, the nursing workforce is the, um, the biggest, the largest group of, of healthcare workforces in Oregon and in the nation. Um, and so we also show the practicing, which is an estimate of the number of nurses who are licensed that, that are likely to be actually practicing and working in Oregon. Um, so you can see there's a slight difference there um, <clears throat> between the licensed nurses and the practicing nurses. Um, so one of the things that we have noticed when we put this data together is that when we look at the ratio between licensed and practicing nurses, we found in the past couple of years that those numbers are starting to diverge. Um, if you looked at 2010 to 2012 data, they differed by around the practicing nurses were about 85% of the licensed nurses. In 2016, that drops, so we're seeing a divergence for some reason, whereas the practicing nurses only account for um, 79%, just under 80%. But what we saw is a residual of a little over 10,000 difference between the number of nurses who are licensed in the state versus the number of nurses who are practicing in the state. So we are going to definitely be looking at, we're also seeing that from 2010 to 2016, the number of licensed nurses in the state grew by 20%, while the number of practicing nurses only grew by 14 and almost 15% during that same time period. So we are seeing the number of licensed nurses in the state growing at a, at a somewhat faster rate than the number of practicing. So we're trying to understand what's causing, um, what, what's causing that to diverge. Um, we have some ideas. And one of the things I want to, I want to point out before we go too far into this is a lot of this is very descriptive information. Um, and what that's really helping us do is really helping us drive our research agenda. So we're going through and we're looking at the data. And as most uh, research studies and, and descriptive analysis show is that when you start pulling back data, when you start looking at the information or the trends that the data are showing you, it often results in a lot of questions 
that you didn't necessarily expect or didn't have going into your initial study. And this is one issue that we are curious about what's going on here. Um, we have some, I have a couple hypotheses, but I'll save that for the end when we actually talk about our, um, our future research plans based on the data we pulled here. Um, next uh, slide we're going to be looking at is the aging of the nursing workforce. As we talked earlier in, uh, in the webinar, we stated that um, the workforce, at least according to the literature, the nursing workforce is aging. These data run a little contrary to that. What we're actually seeing is our workforce is actually a little younger than it was a number of years ago. So if you look at this chart, what you can see, it's a, uh, it's a proportional distribution chart of age groups from 2010 to 2016 by cohort. So what you can see is the black line represents the age distribution in 2010, and the mint, uh, the mint line, the light green line, represents the proportional distribution of nurses by age in 2016. And what you will definitely, what stands out, what stood out to us very clearly is that when you look at the younger age groups, 25 to 34 and 35 to 44, the proportion of nurses in 2016 that fall in those age groups is much larger than it was back in 2010. But then if you look at the groups 44, 5 to 54 and 55 to 64, you'll also see that proportionally more nurses are much older than they were in 2016 and 2010 and 2012. But what you'll see also is from 2010 to 2012, you'll see a drop. So in the older groups of nurses, you'll see proportionally they went down a little bit. In the younger groups, proportionally they went up a little bit. The same thing happened in 14, 2014. Younger nurses grew a little bit, the older nurses dropped off a little bit, and then 2016 continued that trend, and we see um, a great decline in the older number of nurses. This also sparked a lot of questions internally when we were, when we were looking at these kinds of data trying to explain this. The one also very interesting point is if you look at 2010, 2012, and 2014, you'll see that the proportion of nurses that are 65 and older very similar. I mean, those dots just line, just kind of fall right on top of each other. And then all of a sudden, here comes 2016, and boom, it's about almost 10 percentage points different than what it was for the last three years. That was very stable. And we're scratching our head. We also, we have ideas about that one too, but we're, we're scratching our heads trying to understand why all of a sudden did we see this big shift over a two-year period? So we will definitely talk about that more as we get back into future questions, but that's something that kind of popped out to us that, was, that we thought was very interesting. Um, the next slide we're gonna look at is the gender distribution. Um, the dark line at the bottom represents uh, registered nurses, and the mint line at the top represents um, advanced practice registered nurses. And one of the things you'll see that, that jumped out immediately is that the AP, APRNs proportionally have a lot more males than do RNs. That's primarily due to the fact that in the APRNs, we include the certified registered nurse anesthetists, um, and about 50% of those are male. Um, it's actually almost 54%. They do make up a smaller proportion of um, the workforce, but they're big enough to um, they're big enough to drive that change. So what we're basically seeing is the reason that those are so much larger than the RNs is because of the presence of the uh, nurse anesthetists. Um, we also saw a drop in between 2014 and 2016 in the APRNs, and we believe. That was primarily due to a very big jump we had in the number of NPs coming on. Uh, between 2014 and 2016, the number of NPs jumped by double digits, um, almost 20% increase in the number of nurse practitioners in the state. Um, <clears throat> and they primarily are female, so when you have a big increase in a, a predominantly female population, it tends to drive um, trend tends to drive that down. Um, 
Back to the registered nurses, we are seeing increases, albeit slow increases every year. So in 2010, it was about 10% of the RN workforce was um, male. In 2012, that jumped to 11%. In 2014, it jumped to 11.6%. And then in 2016, it jumped to 117 So we are seeing incremental changes. It's going slow, but we are seeing continual changes over the past um, six years that we looked. We also looked at racial and ethnic composition of the registered nurse population, uh, registered nurses as compared to the population of the state. Um, as you can see by table two that's, um, that's being presented right now, um, Oregon nurses tend to be overrepresented in a white population. So 88, um, 88 and a half percent of all registered nurses uh, identified as being white, whereas 78% of the population, or 79% of the population uh, identified as being white. Uh, with the Hispanic population, only 3.4% of nurses identified as being Hispanic, whereas almost 12% of the population. Um, so we are very, so the, the nursing population is very underrepresented, uh, representing of the uh, Hispanic population. Uh, the black population somewhat upper, upper underrepresented. Uh, One percent of RNs identified as black. One point seven of the population. One point seven percent of the population identified as black. Asians are slightly overrepresented in our population, or in the nursing workforce. Uh, Four percent of RNs identified as Asian. Three point six percent of the population. And if you go down, you can see that this that the uh, the proportions are, are, are fairly similar as you get into the Native American, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, other race, and more than one race. Numbers are small, proportions are small, but they're pretty close. They're pretty close to each other. Um, the numbers are small, so we don't really see any, any major differences there. Um, but what is really interesting is the overrepresentation of the white population and a very large underrepresentation of the Hispanic population. Um, next, we're going to look at practice settings. Um, this is where nurses in the um, renewal survey identified as uh, the place, their, their primary place of employment. 55% um, of um, registered nurses in Oregon um, describe or identify a hospital as being their primary place of employment. 10% uh, identify an office or a clinic as their place of employment. Uh, home health and hospice, six percent. Skilled nursing facilities, skilled nursing facilities, and long-term care, four percent. Ambulatory surgical centers, three percent. Public community health, two percent. And all other settings, which include schools, education, um, and all other kinds of setting in which nurses uh, work, at twenty percent of the population. Um, the fifty-five percent of the hospital population is interesting in that. There has been a big push over the years to increase the role of community care in, in the delivery of healthcare across the nation. Um, there's also been a lot of efforts by Oregon and a lot of other states to reduce the reliance of the population on emergency rooms and ho inpatient hospital services, preferring to provide those services in a more cost effective and more an efficient method for the patient, which puts them in community kinds of community based healthcare system and also having a new focus on primary care that's been around for about 20 years. So the so having 55% of our nurse workforce uh, working in the hospital is a little surprising given the big pushes that we've had to uh, augment the role of community care in the overall healthcare delivery. Um, and while 55% is a big number, um, it has been steadily declining. For instance, in 2010, um, we had about 60% of, I mean, about 60% of our nurses claimed that hospitals were their primary workforce. In 2012, that dropped a little bit to 58. Um, in 2014, that jumped back up to 60%. And then in 2016, it dropped back down to 55. So we see a little bit of oscillation going. Um, we've only had one year of data where we see a turn from 60 to 55%. So we're not really sure what that means yet. Um, but this is something we will definitely be looking at. Um, this is also really important for healthcare planning. 
in order to understand what types of nurses you need out in the communities, you need to look to see what kind of healthcare delivery jobs are available in those communities. You also need to look to see where nurses are employed um, to see if you can figure out how to match and plan for um, future work or workforce needs. The next slide looks at practice specialization um, of the workforce. And as you can see um, by table three, which is presented on the screen, um, the medical surgical uh, specialization is the highest at 13.6%. Surgery recovered 11.3, critical care and ICU at 10.7, almost 11%. Emergency urgent care, um, about eight, a little over 8%. OBGYN, women's health, just under 8%. Management administration, just under 5%. And you can go down home health at 4.4, pediatrics at 4.2. Psychiatric, psychiatry and mental health at four, geriatrics at 3.5, oncology 3.4, community-based care 2%, I mean 3.2%, general nursing 2.1, long-term care 2.1, and all other specialties combined um, a little over 16%. Okay, so right now we're going to take a, a time for questions if there's are any. Uh, before we go on to a, we're going to change tax a little bit and talk about more specific issues, um, but we wanted to stop and see if anybody had questions uh, as we were discussing the uh, the more general information. All right, we're going to turn to anybody who has asked any questions. Also, go to the chat. Drink of water. Drink of water. Thank you. Okay. It looks like we don't have any questions right now. There's still opportunities later. Mm -hmm. If you something comes up, but we'll go ahead and move on to the next section. Absolutely. And I would be more than happy to answer questions if you didn't have time to get them in um, at this little break. We'll definitely pick them up towards the end. Um, what we're going to start talking about now are we're going to be focused on a couple issues. Um, the first off we're going to be looking at is educational attainment. Um, as most folks working in the nursing workforce research uh, area know that in 2010, the Institutes of Medicine, now known as the National Academy of Medicine, issued a goal of having 80% of all RNs across the country hold a BSN, which is a Bachelor of Science of Nursing, by 2020. So they're looking to have 80% of all RNs to hold a BSN by 2020. One of the questions we get asked a lot, is Oregon going to make that goal? And our answer is a very simple, no, it's not going to make that goal. Um, and as we were looking at the data behind this, so as you can see on table four that's in front of you, um, you can see the split uh, from 2012 to 2014, um, whereas in 2012, 52% had an ADN or less, and 48% had a BSN or higher. By 2016, we had seen a shift where an ADN degree um, was 46%, whereas uh, nurses with a BSN or higher was at 54%. So we have seen movement, and we actually saw movement in 2014. It jumped from 48 in 2012 to 51% in 2014. Um, so we are seeing movement in that direction, but it's it's very slow. Uh, um, we're only jumping a couple percentage points every two years, so we are seeing some slow growth. And one of the questions we wanted to know is we have been in contact where we have read, talked to folks in other states that are seeing this rate of BSN trained or BSN educated nurses growing at a much faster rate than we're seeing here in Oregon. So we were curious about what some of the reasons for that. And um, one of the things we looked at, oh, so this is, um, to take a little sidestep, this is what's going on nationally in terms of um, the proportion of BSN trained nurses growing over time. Um, what you can see is that from 2009, 
to 2015, uh, BSN trained nurses grew by about 4% a year, whereas ADN educated nurses grew only by about 1% a year. And while that doesn't sound like a huge difference in the rate of growth across these two groups of nursing, uh, this is one of those instances where just the, the scale of the number of nurses employed starts having a role. So in there right now, there are about 3 million, just over 3 million nurses um, working in the, in the country. So a 4% year, a 4% growth a year over a six year period, seven year period, means that the BSN trained RN workforce grew by nearly 400,000 over that time period, where ADN educated nurses only grew by 78,000. So you can see that even though the rate in which those populations are growing isn't that different, 4% versus 1%, um, when you start applying those, those growth rates to pretty big numbers, you actually see some pretty big divergence. Um, so, so that's kind of in, that, that's interesting and kind of supports what we're seeing in that we are seeing very slow, um, steady growth. And it's comparable to what we're seeing in terms of um, BSN growth nurses, where we're seeing about three, four percent every every year. But one of the questions we ask is. Why aren't we seeing, uh, why isn't our proportion of BSN educated RNs growing at a faster rate? Why aren't we approaching that 50%? So we started asking ourselves some questions about what could be causing that, what could be causing that to be slower growth than we, than we see in other states. Um, and one of the things we were wondering is that do ADN educated nurses are they staying in the work workforce longer than BSN trained nurses? So we may be bringing in a lot of BSN trained nurses, but if the ADN educated ADN educated nurses are putting off retirement but staying in the workforce, what you would expect to see is that the BSN trained nurses tend to be in the younger cohorts and the ADN nurses tend to be a little older than the BSN nurses. And this chart, figure six, uh, provides information that supports that idea. So the dark line, the black line, is the BSN educated nurses. The mint line is the ADN educated nurses. And what you see is the, the x-axis of the bottom horizontal axis is actually age and years. So what you see is nurses that are younger, less than 50, there tend to be a lot more of BSN trained nurses at that age group than there are for ADN trained nurses. But after 50, you'll see that we have a cross, that the older nurses are predominantly ADN educated, whereas um, the minority are BSN trained nurses, which is interesting and supports that idea. Um, and one of the issues that we're dealing with in this is we're dealing with a lot of indirect evidence. We don't know exactly what's causing this, so we're doing is we're, we're asking ourselves questions, we're formulating hypotheses, and we're testing those hypotheses directly, knowing that we can't get to the answer directly head on. We have to come about it through different kinds of indirect lines of evidence, and hopefully that with the more kinds of converging lines of evidence you look at, they all kind of point to the same picture. So this is one that suggests that ADN trained nurses are staying in the workforce longer, they're putting off retirement, um, and so they may be masking the impact of, grow, of the high growth that we see in the younger nurses with BS, by BSN train, training. So another way of looking at that is looking at age of their original license and seeing how old when they were licensed, what proportion, what and how many nurses RNs, this is again RNs, have a BSN versus those who hold an ADN. And so we looked at the age of the original light organ nursing license was issued, and we looked at it by education. And what you see is nurses who were granted or who obtained their license at a younger age were much more likely, 
much more likely, like almost four times more likely to hold a BSN than an ADN. That shifts just around age 28. Or so for nurses who are 28 years of old, age or older, when they first obtain their nursing license in Oregon, they're more likely to hold an ADN than a BSN. But nurses younger than 28 are significantly more likely to hold a BSN than an ADN, which again is very interesting and is supportive of the idea that Oregon's moving full towards that goal in that we're bringing in a lot of BSN trained nurses as a younger workforce. But then the slide previous shows that the ADN nurses are delaying retirement and staying and staying in their jobs for longer than we would expect for a BSN trained nurse. So it looks like we have two things, two dynamics kind of going on at the same time. We have one is we are bringing in a higher number and a higher proportion of BSN educated nurses as 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 they come out of school and as are they're young as they are young and and the old Older nurses getting their license it tends to be um, ADN trained. And so one of the things we wanted to look at to further uh, provide evidence for that point is we wanted to see. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I just got talking. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> even look. Um, and so what we did next is we said, okay, so if it's true that ADN nurses are delaying retirement. We ought to be able to answer that question directly. We do ask that question, or that question is asked in the survey, on the uh, renewal survey that OHA administers uh, for nurses. And so we just looked at the data, just looked at the administrative data. And so what you'll see, and what's important here is this graph's a little confusing, so I'm gonna walk through it uh, carefully with you so you can understand what we're seeing with this. So the, again, the green line or the mint line is the ADN educated RNs. The dark black line is the BSN educated nurses. And what you see, and so what we're looking at is the number of RNs who are planning to retire in more than five years. So what you see is after about age 50, you can see that the ADN nurses have a big bulge um, from about 60 to the mid, from about 53 or 54 into the mid 60s, where ADN nurses are much more likely than a BSN trained nurse to say that they're gonna be uh, retiring in more than five years. So, what you can see is that the BSN trained nurses are less likely to wait that long. So this is five years or more, which includes, you know, people who will be retiring in 10 years, 15 years or whatever, but it's more than five years. So the nurses who are ADN trained and over age 50 tend to be delaying retirement at a much higher rate than our BSN trained nurses. So, Taken all together, it looks like we have some dynamics going on, suggesting that while we are bringing in a lot of in our in the new workforce, people who are new, new to nursing are much more likely to hold the BSN and be younger, obviously, than the more established workforce who tends to be a little more ADN trained, tends to be a little older, and they tend to be they tend to intend to stay in the workforce for longer than you would expect for a same age nurse with the BSN. So it looks like we're gonna have to figure out how to tease those two dynamics apart to really try to understand how educational progression is working in Oregon. Um, at the face of it, we're not gonna make our 80% by 2020. Um, we've got three years to go 30%. That's not gonna happen, but, it, what we may see is as the ADN trained nurses, the older part portion of the Oregon nursing workforce, as they do start retiring, what we will we might see, and I think we might will probably see, is we will see the proportion of BSN trained nurses really start ticking up every year. It'll start going at a much, much faster rate. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about future retirement. And so we've looked at both RNs and advanced practice registered nurses. 
just to get a general sense of their retirement plans. And what we see is that RNs and APRNs are very similar in terms of what their future retirement plans are. Um, the number, the proportion of nurses that are planning to retire in the next two years is about 4% for both RNs and APRNs. Um, nurses planning on retiring in the next three to five years, again, very similar, 9.9% .9 for RNs, 10.8% for APRNs, very, very similar. Um, nurses planning to retire in six to 10 years, we start seeing a little divergence here, 12.7% for RNs, 17.5% for APRNs. And then at, uh, more than 10 years is 61% of RNs and 58% of um, APRNs plan to retire in more than 10 years. And about 10% of each group, 11.9% of RNs and 9.4% of APRNs don't know when they're going to retire. They, they really just don't know yet. So, um, so that's basically the, the, the data I wanted to talk about today. Um, what we I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes is how this has driven our future research. So the first question is the thing we talked about very early on. Um, why is the number of licensed and practicing nurses diverging? Um, A month and a half, two months ago, um, we would have been scratching our head going, we're not really quite sure why this is happening. But in the past couple of months, we've gotten some information. We've been working with the uh, Oregon State Board of Nursing, OSBN, on a, a project looking at the number of nurses that are endorsing into the state. What that basically means is they've been licensed in another state and they come into Oregon they come into Oregon um, to get a license and they go through OSBN to um, to get their license obtained or to obtain their license and OSBN has been telling us that that number has been jumping um, and what we did is we went back through our data and sure enough it has jumped it started in about 2013 and the number of nurses that are endorsing into the state has really really grown uh, in fact, in 2016, when we look, we're actually endorsing more license or more nurses than we're uh, that are getting their license through examination. So, um, so that's interesting. It also could be why the license and practices nurses is diverging. An endorsed license, an endorse, and a nurse who obtains their license through endorsement doesn't necessarily work here. Um, it could be for telemedicine, it could be for travelers, uh, nurses that come into temporary assignments in hospitals across the state and they could be moving around, especially uh, since a lot of our um, areas of the state that border other states are fairly rural and they are having issues filling uh, permanent positions for nurses. They're more likely, in fact, we, uh, Jane and I have been into South Oregon and Eastern Oregon very recently, and we've heard um, folks in, the, in those parts of the state talk about their need for nurse uh, professionals in their hospitals and health clinics, unable to, uh, unable to obtain them will often fall to travelers. So we're wondering how much of the license versus practicing diver divergence that we see is due to a, a big influx in, um, in endorsed nurses. Um, again, what caused a sudden increase in the nurses over age 65? So we're looking at the aging workforce. Um, a couple things are interesting here. One is the literature for a long time has stated that the workforce, the nursing workforce is aging. Um, there's been literature suggesting that nursing as a profession hasn't been as attractive to younger um, younger people in the population. So they're just not choosing that as, as a workforce. Um, and, and we've seen that literature for a very long time, but in Oregon, we don't necessarily see that. And I haven't seen anything in the literature recently that tells me that we're seeing this at a national level. So it could be, it could be us right now. It could, we, we're not really quite sure what's going on with that. But one thing's for certain is we've got three years of data that suggests that the nursing workforce in Oregon in 2016 is younger than the nursing workforce in Oregon in 2010 and in 2012 and 2014. It, 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 it was somewhat younger. Um, 
what could be causing the nurse the the increase in nurses over age 65 it could be adn nurses uh putting off retirement even longer than than we thought before uh, we're not 100 percent sure that will be something we will definitely be looking at um, as we start to going down some of this other stuff. Um, again, are nurses delaying retirement and working longer, especially ADN educated nurses? Um, that's a question we still ask. We don't have direct evidence on that. We do have some indirect evidence that we presented to you um, previously that suggests that ADN educated nurses are delaying retirement, but we really don't know for sure. We have, so, so that's part of the research that we're gonna be looking at is, is trying to figure out a way, a method to use to answer some of these questions more directly, which will allow us to dig into it. Um, again, many questions arose concerning our educational attainment and progression, uh, specifically questioning uh, the focus of the lack of growth of BSN educated nurses, even though we are seeing a lot of them coming into the state uh, that you can see on um, figure seven, you can definitely see that the proportion of BSN trained nurses is definitely increasing in the younger uh, proportions of the workforce. Overall, it, it just isn't going very much. So that really kind of wraps up the um, data I wanted to share with y'all today and our ideas about it. So we're going to open it up for um, questions. for questions. And we have a few. So Excellent. thank you to those people who wrote in some questions. So let's just kind of go back and talk about. Um, first one, is hospital variation due to the hospital closures or hospital services not being offered for for example, surgery. So I think it's going back to mm -hmm. the idea about the nurses mm -hmm. and what settings that they're working cool. in. Um, so, you know, there is a literature suggesting that rural hospitals have been facing crises for decades. Um, funding opportunities and keeping hospitals uh, open in smaller communities has been a challenge for a long time. That is a very interesting question. It's something we need to be looking at. Um, we would want to see if the proportion of nurses that are working in hospitals is just dropping. It absolutely could be because there's less hospital slots available because there's fewer hospitals. And that is definitely something we're gonna be looking at. So I, I, we can't answer that, answer that question directly. It's a very good question and it is definitely something we would wanna look at. Um, we are in the process of looking at a, a project, looking at the, comparing rural nurses in a rural setting to an urban setting and one of the things we're going to be looking at is the availability of hospital beds mm -hmm. as a proxy for this kind of question okay. good all right thank you and then when looking at data for license and practicing does this include out-of-state nurses who, who have nursing licenses for temporary staff in locums work that goes back to the traveling nurses mm -hmm. and what and the the data that we've been working with the oregon state board of nursing on about the nurses that are getting licensed by endorsement this endorsement it probably doesn't it, it absolutely does include those nurses we just don't really understand where they're coming from we don't understand we have so many questions about them so we're going to be doing a lot more work on them um, another question do you think bsn growth is due to hiring requirements that have changed to require bsn versus rn um yes as a simple answer is yes um, it, it, unfortunately, what we're discovering is uh, everything is, is, is really interrelated, retirement, education, it's all kind of interrelated in there. Um, we know that there are some employers that are requiring BSNs where in the past they may not have. Um, one of the things we're also hearing from um, our colleagues in the rural parts of the state is they'll take, they, they, they they're not holding that requirement as rigidly as um, as some of the urban counter as some of the urban uh, settings are. So um, so yes, it, it's probably being driven partly by uh, employer requirements, but we're not seeing that in some of the rural parts of the state. But yeah, it probably is to some degree driving it. Yeah, it's a long answer to yes. <laughs> that was a very long answer. It's a long answer to yes. Okay, um, another question. Is there any data that shows the number of ADN to BSN RNs? For example, those ADN prepared RNs furthering their education by participating in RN to BSN programs. Uh, there is. 
Um, we have a couple ways of looking at it. Um, one is we look at uh, the initial uh, the initial degree or initial education that uh, a nurse held on licensure, and then we can go back and look to see the same nurse what their highest level degree is, and so we can look to see how that is. We haven't analyzed that data in any depth. I've kind of glanced at it. Um, and there's also information that we get directly from um, the pro, the school, the nursing programs in the state that talk about graduation rates and stuff. Um, and we just haven't had a chance to look at that data in any depth. But yes, it, it is out there. And it's something we're definitely going to be looking at as we do a deep dive into educational progression. And data, including those not hold those who hold leader. Excuse me. Let me start over on that one. Is ADM data including those who hold leadership roles and not practicing? It does. Okay. And then, do you have data showing the percent of nurses in Oregon who work in informatics as a specialty? No. Yeah, I don't think it's broken down that way. No, it isn't. How, um, okay. How about the breakdown of educational? education attainment in informatics nurses in the state? Now, that, that is a good question. Um, and I know health informatics is, is, a, is a very growing field right now. Um, and that's not a, my guess is that during the renewal process when they're completing that survey, that is not something that they have an opportunity to choose. So if they either write it in that data is just unavailable to us to see how many how many nurses are employed in informatics. Yeah, they can. It's one of those things where they can list as an other. Yeah. So we could go back and look at those that happen to say other, but that's not going to capture everybody. So we don't right. can't give a really accurate yeah. look at that. Um, okay. Also, have you looked at rural versus urban salaries, and would this affect the data? Um, we have not. Um, I haven't looked at it directly. Um, we have talked to the employment department here. Uh, we are looking at that. Uh, we are very interested in, in the rural nursing workforce. Um, and we have talked to folks. Um, it probably has, it, well, obviously pay has an impact on the workforce. Um, yeah, we haven't looked at that yet. We haven't looked at that directly. I think that, that, I think that that's gonna be a bigger discussion as we are looking at um, the rural versus urban. Yeah. Because we, we are taking a look at the, the story that we're getting when we're going around the state really is that we have a lot of nurses that are coming. We are we're graduating a fair amount of nurses. Plus, we have an enormous amount of nurses that are coming in state that are licensed out of state. And yet, with all of these nurses that are coming in, when we go to rural parts of the state, they are the number one thing they say to us is that they can't find enough nurses. And they share with us the challenges that they have about staffing nurses. So it goes back to what Rick was saying in the very beginning. It's so much, and it's not even an issue of how many nurses, are we gonna have a shortage or how many nurses do we have? It really is an issue of where are the nurses being distributed? And is there a way to incentivize distribution in another way? And I think that that's where salaries is, that yeah. the data around salaries would be the important. So, this, so far this is the final question, but you are certainly welcome to answer, um, submit other questions if you have them. Um, this question is, so potentially an explanation since the data was highest degree attained, could be that younger ADNs are more likely to go back to school for BSNs than older ADNs. Um, yes, that is possible. Um, Yes, that is possible. Um, we have the data to look at that. We have not. To, to date, I have, I have, as I talked earlier, I have looked at ADN educated nurses going back to school to get their BSN. And I, I, I see it, but we really haven't done anything with it. But that is definitely something we would want to look at to see when those RN to BSN programs are the most effective. Mm -hmm. Are they effective? Do they have more impact on a younger? basically a younger workforce and an older workforce. There's ideas to suggest that they do. Um, from my personal experience, you know, I was in school for a very long time. I'm kind of done. I'm never <laughs> going back. So I can see a lot of people doing that. And when they get into the 30s and 40s, they get a life established. Do you really want to go back to school? Yeah. And 
if you don't necessarily have to, you may not. Right. But it definitely is an interesting way of looking at it, and it's something we will definitely be incorporating uh, in, in more deep, much more detail when we start looking at our educational progression study. Yeah, that was a really good question. Thanks for asking that. Um, another question has come in. With slots of nursing schools limited and nurses go out of state for training, do you see them returning to Oregon? Yes, probably. Um, we are seeing, as I said earlier, we're seeing a huge number of of, um, of um, endorsing nurses coming back. So it's very likely that these are people who used to live in Oregon, left to go out of state um, for training, obtained a license there and came back. Um, but the data we get doesn't help us tell them we don't really know that for sure yet, so we're going to have to do a little bit more work. But my guess is yes. What we do know is we, from the study that we did before Ricky came here, so he doesn't have this information, but the the we did a study on newly licensed nurses, and when, in the survey that we did of, of newly licensed nurses, what we do know is that if a nurse is trained in the state, seventy about 74% of newly licensed nurses they attend, that are practicing or attended an Oregon-based nursing program. So if so, that's about almost three quarters of the people that were. Are, what are you saying? Anyway, so there's about 74 percent of the people that are that that are that were newly licensed actually attended an Oregon program, and they are currently practicing in the states. All right. I think that was the last question. Does anyone else have any other questions? All right, I'm not seeing anything else, and we are just about at time. I hope that you have finished your lunch and that um, this was engaging and interesting to you. So I really appreciate everyone who came today. Um, thank you, Rick. Thank you. And uh, I mean, really do appreciate it. Uh, we will be doing these um as we as we publish um some of our major work um this is the first of i'm hoping a long series of webinars uh showcasing uh the research at ocf and this is the first time that we've done a webinar to showcase our research and so after this is over we might send you a survey to get your feedback on how you think this went um and just get some information so that when we do this again um, this will, uh, we can make sure that we're providing you the information that's really useful and helpful to you. Thank you everyone for attending and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you very much.